are really well known in, in the children's literature world for your advocacy of nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, but what is really so great is that you, like the Deglo brothers, you find these, um, you know, like things that kind of fly under the radar. And I think that's really apparent in the book that you've just written that's coming out in April, right? Mm -hmm. And it's called Can I See Your ID? And it's true stories of false identities. So what you've done is taken really imaginative play in shark mm. versus train to like the extreme, right? <laughs> Wouldn't you say? I, I'd never thought of it that way, but yeah, <laughs> these, these are people who, you know, for, for one motivation or another, are afraid of these new identities for mm -hmm. themselves. And what, so, what, caught, what was your, I mean, what was the spark of creative, I mean, what, what gave you the idea to do this book? Well, there were, there were three, three of the subjects of the book um, had been on my mind for one reason or another. Um, uh, the first one was Karan Thomas, who is he's the, he's the first profile in the book. Um, when Karan Thomas was 16 years old, and back in 1993, um, he he really really liked trains. He was a, a, a train buff in New York, and he impersonated a subway motorman for three hours. He drove the A train for three hours on a Saturday afternoon. When he was 16. When he was 16, almost got away with it. He made. He was, he was on time, there were no incidents, and then, of course, if he had completely gotten away with it, we wouldn't have known his story, and there wouldn't be, he wouldn't be a, a profile in this book. But I had been in New York uh, on a couple of magazine internships, the first part of, of, of 1993, and I had just left to come back to Texas right before that incident. It made national headlines, and so I think that's why I kind of tuned into that story back then, and I always remembered, remembered the story, remembered the guy's name. Um, well, years later, uh, for some reason or another, um, John Howard Griffin, who was the author of Black Like Me, um, came on my radar screen. And at that point, I had not even read his book. I was, but I was one of those books I was aware of. I knew the story about how, you know, this white reporter had darkened his skin. And this was in 1959 for this really harrowing, um, you know, road trip through the American South. And so he could, he could. You know, try to get some mm -hmm. idea of what it was like to, to experience life in the Deep South as an African American. Um, and so I, that basically existed as, a, you know, as the words John Howard Griffin on a scrap of paper in right. my, my nonfiction idea drawer. And then I read Susan Campbell Bartoletti's book, Hitler Youth. Um, and one of the profiles in that book, one of the, one of the, one of the characters written about in that book was a guy named Solomon Peril, who was a teenage Jew uh, from Germany who spent World War II at, under an assumed name at a school for Hitler, an elite school for Hitler Youth. Uh, that's, that's how he, he made wow. it through the Holocaust when his, his parents and, and one of his sisters perished uh, during the war. Uh, and it, it occurred to me that, oh, that each of these three characters, even though their stories were very different, they had this common thread of pretending to be someone that they, that they weren't. You know, what, would that, what would that be like to, mm -hmm. to, whether it's for a few hours in the case of, of Karan Thomas or a few weeks or several years in the case of, of, of Solomon Carroll? Uh, what, what sort of pressures would, would that be like? How do you pull that off? What, what is in common about these three stories and how are these three stories different? And if I can find these three guys, who else could I find to, to write about? And so I ended up you know, coming up with seven other people uh, who, for one reason or another, pretended to be someone that they weren't. And Well, yeah. probably the most, um, or one of the most famous in there is Frank Abagnale, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, was, they made a feature film about, uh, called Catch Me If I Can, if you can, Catch Me If You Can, right. with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, so I, you know, we, we're all kind of familiar just via that, but I just, the stories are fascinating because you know when you start thinking about false identity, um, it's it, the question I think it then becomes well how far can you extend it, you know, in, in your own life as a as a as that person. All right, and I think that uh, I think this is something that especially you know, young adult readers can can relate to because your adolescence is an extended period of, of wondering you know, who am I. I think you really are trying on identities when mm -hmm. you're an adolescent. No, yeah, you're it's, absolutely it's, right. It's generally not as as extreme as pretending to be a, a motorman on the, you know, the Metropolitan Transit <laughs> Authority, but um, it yeah. takes a certain kind of um, panache. It does. I mean, and there are. 
you know, there are, are sort of tricks of the trade that I, I, I realized as I was going through all of these, uh, uh, as I was doing my research for these stories and writing these stories about how do you, if you want to, not that I would recommend such a thing, but if you wanted to pull pull this off, what are the things to keep in mind? The one is to, uh, you know, dress the part. People people don't see who you are. People see the part that you're playing. So when Frank Abagnale was was you know, 16 years old. Um, as a runaway in New York City, before he had, you know, as, as shown in the movie, he was most famous for you know, putting on a pilot's uniform and, mm -hmm. and pretending to be a pilot, uh, among other among other professional guys. But even when he was just a 16-year-old runaway in New York, um, he falsified his, his driver's license. He looked mature enough that he was able to pass himself off as 26. And so when he walked into a bank, people saw a 26-year-old because that's how that's how he was projecting himself. So yeah, you. You, you, you dress the part, uh, you keep your mouth shut. The, the fewer you know, details that you give about, uh, you know, the, the fewer things you, you, you make up, the fewer things you have to keep straight. And then mm -hmm. the, the third big lesson is, you know, let the people who would otherwise uncover you, give them an opportunity to feel smart. One of the, the best example of this was uh, the story of Princess Caribou, who was, this was an impoverished uh, young woman in, in 19th century England who pretended to be you know, an Asian princess who had been kidnapped and then shipped, and I guess, jumped overboard off the right, coast of England. Right. Um, well, all of these people, and all these you know, well-to-do people in, in the English you know, countryside town where she, where she wound up, they would you know, bring over their atlases and their books about Asia and, and you know, spout off random bits of information you know, or pseudo-information they had gleaned about Asia. Um, sort of trying to impress each other with how much they knew about the region. And they, they thought that she couldn't speak English, she couldn't understand English, but what they were doing was, now they were, in the books that they brought, and the stories that they told, they were sort of feeding her pieces of information that she needed in order to, uh, you know, sort of to carry out this, this, this masquerade for a couple of months. Um, but, but her, her presence and this role that she was playing gave all these people a chance to show off to each other how, how educated that they were, how educated they thought they were. And there are lots of other examples That's like this throughout the story. So in a way, they're, all, they're almost endowing their, their re, not readers, their audience, with their own imagined identity, mm -hmm. well, in a almost, way. It, it, it's almost like a, like a, an improv show where the, the, the actors on stage ask for clues from the audience or tips mm -hmm. from the audience. Well, what do you want us to work in the improv? Well, in, in the, for example, the case of Princess Caribou, they were they would mention a dagger, they would mention this or that, and she would just work those into the, into the part that she was playing. A lot yeah. of it was in, was in pantomime because she wasn't speaking English, but uh, yeah. she was. You had to be you had to be very sharp, very mentally sharp, to be able to do this, even if you're at the same time uh, perhaps a little bit disturbed mentally to, to have the <laughs> desire to do this. Wow. Well, there are two aspects of the book that I find really compelling. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is the graphics. You introduce each new uh, person with a, with a wonderful graphic and it has a, the graphics provide a kind of darkness um, so it feels like it's picking up on the dark aspect of, you know, identity, impersonation, or whatever you want to call it, um, pseudo-identity or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and so it picks up that kind of darkness, it, but it also sort of gives an element of mystery. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit about the graphics and, um, you know, why the graphics and, and what you... Uh, you know, hoped for with them and well, sure. what you think they're doing? I mean, it was... I think the main thing it gives is this sort of a, you know, a mysterious, noirish feel to the book. And the, mm -hmm. the actual cover of the book has been changed from red to blue, so that sort of enhances the, the noirish feel. It looks right. looks mm -hmm. uh, you know, very sort of 1950s-ish. It uh, does. Cool jazz, noir. Uh -huh. um, but the, one of the ideas we had, the dial of books for young readers and I had at, at the beginning was that this, this would be a book that you know, could appeal among other, you know, to, among other audiences uh, to uh, to reluctant readers, and that having having a sort of graphic novel style uh, style panel for each uh, each chapter would be uh, would be a compelling way to, to bring readers into the story. It also helped that I mean, if, if we didn't have, and I don't think this is a book you could really effectively um, illustrate using photographs because. You know, these people did not have camera crews following them around while they were in the, in the act of pretending to be someone that they weren't. Right. In some cases, there were, for example, for, for John Howard Griffin, there were 
were the reenactment photos taken uh, yeah. later on. But you did not have you know, these these people were were sort of in hiding at the time they were they were playing these roles. So there there, there don't exist those sorts of photographs that would accurately tell the tale. Um, Paul Hopp is the illustrator who who did the uh, did the, the panels for this, and I think he did he did just a, a terrific job. Um, he definitely did. It took about half a second of me looking at his website after my editor said, hey, we're thinking about maybe having Paul Hopp be the, to illustrate this book. And I went to, to his website. And I, yeah, I thought, yes, absolutely. He's who I want to, to do this. Uh, the the other thing that you did that I find so fascinating is you wrote the different essays in second person. And, um, you know, first of all, that's such an unusual choice for point of view, mm -hmm. I think, where, where, in my experience, where you see second person a lot is in poetry. Right. Um, you know, I think it's kind of the voice of, of, the, of poetry in, in a million ways, but, um, but it's so surprising to see it here, and, but yet it's so effective because, because you're kind of extending, like the, like the person you're talking about, you're kind of extending the, uh, you know, the impersonation, the, the, the mistaken identity onto the reader himself mm -hmm. or herself. It's really cool what you've done. Can can you talk about that? Well, yeah, I, I was I was kind of surprised to find myself doing it too. Um, I had the uh, I had the, uh, the big stacks of research done for Karan Thomas and, and for Solomon Peril, but I hadn't started writing anything yet, and, and uh, I hadn't really found found a, a voice or the way because their stories are, and tone are really quite different. You know, you know Solomon Peril was in a life mm -hmm. or death you know, situation, and Karan Thomas it was more of a lark. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know what was going to really tie those stories together. But one evening, it just occurred to me that yeah, I can. I can tell these stories in second person. Put the reader into Karan Thomas's position. Put the reader into Solomon Peril's position. And from that point on, I really couldn't imagine not writing it that way. It, it seemed kind of kind of daunting at first. Like I couldn't possibly write it that way. But then I couldn't possibly not write it that way. And so the, it was. It was. Kind of a big question mark of whether I would be able to to effectively carry that out for uh, for eight more profiles beyond those first two. It's almost like you're putting the the person's skin on top of the reader. It's it's really effective. Well, thank you. I'm I'm glad that it is. And I, I sort of took the same approach to the author's note. We're trying to put the the, the reader into the role of of you know, Chris Barton, the author of, the, of this book. And so I, wow. I kind of gave myself the same treatment that I gave uh, mm -hmm. the, the ten subjects in this book. Okay, I have a sneak question for you. Sneak question. Okay, if you, Chris Barton, <laughs> or first of all, are you the real Chris Barton? I am the real Chris Barton. <laughs> but if you, if you got to take on a, a false identity, what would you take on? Uh, of, the, of the characters in this book? No, of just anything in the world or oh the universe. God. Oh my gosh, if I, could, if I could take on the role of anyone in the universe. Uh, who, would you, who would you impose? Well, like a lot of uh, people who have no musical talent, I'd probably you know, be trying to be, pass myself off as a, as a musician. A rock star. <laughs> well, you know what? You are rapidly becoming a rock star in children's literature. No kidding. Well, thank you. <laughs>